Welcome to the first lecture on The Great Gatsby. The Great Gatsby is a novel that's often read by high school students, but very rarely understood by high school students. The Great Gatsby is a work of modernist fiction. It is a novel in which the author, F. Scott Fitzgerald, would like to interrogate the concept of the American dream. The American dream, in a nutshell, is the concept that immigrants to this country can rise very quickly in terms of financial prosperity and class. That is, immigrants can elevate themselves in terms of wealth, how much money they have, and in terms of class standing, to go from low class to middle class to upper class. This is a concept around which the American identity is built. So, when you were young, odds are your parents looked down into your crib and said, when you grow up, you can be anything you want. You can be a doctor, a lawyer, senator, astronaut, president of the United States. That is, your parents instilled in you the concept of the American dream. That you could rise in this country in terms of wealth and class standing to become anything you wanted to be. That is, there were few barriers preventing you from achieving your dreams. In this novel, F. Scott Fitzgerald wants to examine that idea and determine if it is a myth or if it is a reality. The title character, Jay Gatsby, is a striver. He's a person who has been raised on stories about the American dream. In this novel, F. Scott Fitzgerald is going to track the progress of Gatsby, a person who works hard, is charming, and has some connections to see if the concept of the American dream is valid. But that's not where we're going to start. We're going to start with our narrator, Nick Carraway. Nick Carraway is from the Midwest. As this novel opens, he is moving to New York specifically to learn the bond business so that he can become a successful businessman. That is, he too is exerting force on his own American dream. The setting is America in the early 1920s. Picture this. The First World War has recently ended. A number of American soldiers died in Europe, but most have returned home. There is a new sentiment in the air. Live now because the future is uncertain. Also in America, there is a new financial hope. Because of the war, America has placed itself in the center of the world economy. Anyone who can invest in the stock market stands to earn a great deal of money, creating the belief that anyone, no matter how poor, can make it in America. The concept of subjectivity is new, and so Nick Carraway is going to introduce himself by explaining his bias, his privilege, and his belief system so we can better understand his point of view as the novel moves forward. In the introduction, notice that Nick Carraway tells us that he has come from prominent people and that he has been educated at private schools. In other words, he has come from long-standing family wealth and he has high social standing. Chapter 1, The Introduction, with Nick Carraway. In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. Whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages that you've had. He didn't say any more, but we've always been unusually communicative in a reserved way, and I understood that he meant a great deal more than that. In consequence, I'm inclined to reserve all judgments, a habit that has opened up many curious natures to me and also made me the victim of not a few veteran bores. The abnormal mind is quick to detect and attach itself to this quality when it appears in a normal person, and so it came about that in college I was unjustly accused of being a politician because I was privy to the secret griefs of wild, unknown men. Most of the confidences were unsought. Frequently, I have feigned sleep, preoccupation, or a hostile levity when I realized by some unmistakable sign that an intimate revelation was quivering on the horizon, for the intimate revelations of young men 
or at least the terms in which they express them, are usually plagiaristic and marred by obvious suppressions. Let's pause here. So what's Nick telling us? He's telling us that he's come from money, and because of that he feels an obligation to those people who have not come from privilege. In college, he delayed judgment on people. That is, he listened to other people for a long time without coming to a conclusion about what sort of people they were. And so he was accused of being a politician. That is, he was accused of trying to know a lot of people, to be popular. Because of that, he heard a lot of stories from young men that he says were plagiaristic, that they got from books or film or radio shows or magazines. That is, young men wanted to boast about their accomplishments, but the accomplishments weren't real. They were made up. They were the things that they garnered from other sources. This is going to explain why Nick, in a few pages, is going to put up with Gadsby for such a long time when it is fairly clear that Gadsby, too, is one of these plagiaristic young men who is telling lies as though they were the truth. Reserving judgments is a matter of infinite hope. I am still a little afraid of missing something if I forget that, as my father snobbishly suggested and I snobbishly repeat, a sense of the fundamental decencies is parceled out unequally at birth. And, after boasting this way of my tolerance, I come to the admission that it has a limit. Conduct may be founded on the hard rock or on the wet marshes, but after a certain point, I don't care what it's founded on. When I came back from the East last autumn, I felt that I wanted the world to be in uniform and at a sort of moral attention forever. I wanted no more riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart. Only Gatsby, the man who gives his name to this book, was exempt from my reaction. Gatsby, who represented everything for which I have unaffected scorn. In this, Nick reveals two important things. One, the events in this novel were so disturbing to him that he lost hope in some of his ideals. This novel is often presented as a serious reflection on the popular American concept of the American dream. It is that, but it's also a soap opera. This novel is filled with murder, treachery, and affairs. The popular concept of the American dream in this novel has consequences, which includes death. 2. By nature, Nick is an honest person. He dislikes untruthfulness and deception, two qualities that Gatsby has in spades. But... To preface his story, Nick explains that there was something wondrous about Gadsby, some heightened sensitivity and expansiveness that made Nick admire Gadsby, despite his flaws. The First Scene, The Party at the Buchanan's There are two basic ways to introduce secondary characters in a novel. An author can introduce them one at a time, which is the strategy in Huck Finn. In Huck Finn, in those early chapters, we meet one new character in most every chapter. At first we meet Huck, and then we meet Tom Sawyer, and then we meet Jim, and then we meet Pap, and so on. The other common strategy is to allow readers to meet all the characters at once, which is the strategy that F. Scott Fitzgerald employs in The Great Gatsby. This is a little more difficult for readers to navigate, and so I want to take us step by step through that first large dinner party in which we meet Tom and Daisy Buchanan and also Jordan. Now, don't think my opinion on these matters is final, he seemed to say, just because I'm stronger and more of a man than you are. We start with the voice of Tom Buchanan, a man who never works. A man who keeps polo ponies but rarely plays polo. A man who, through money from his parents, has been able to afford multiple mansions. In terms of social standing, Tom is at the top of the pyramid. He is part of the lazy, aimless rich, people so well off they lack ambition. And here we see the dark underside of the American dream. If a person achieves great wealth, It often destroys their children. I got a nice place here, he said, his eyes flashing about restlessly. Turning me around by one arm, 
He moved a broad, flat hand along the front vista, including in its sweep a sunken Italian garden, a half-acre of deep, pungent roses, and a snub-nosed motorboat that bumped the tide offshore. It belonged to Domain, the oil man. He turned me around again, politely and abruptly. We'll go inside. We walked through a high hallway into a bright, rosy-colored space, fragilely bound into the house by French windows at either end. The windows were ajar and gleaming white against the fresh grass outside that seemed to grow a little way into the house. A breeze blew through the room, blew curtains in at one end and out the other like pale flags, twisting them up toward the frosted wedding cake of the ceiling, and then rippled over the wine-colored rug, making a shadow on it as wind does on the sea. But also... There's no denying that there's glamour in the lives of Tom and Daisy Buchanan. Their estate is exceptionally stylish. In a world before TV and blockbuster movies, the rich were celebrities. News and gossip about their lives would appear regularly in New York papers. And so, Nick is also attracted to this world as well. What are you doing, Nick? I'm a Bond man. Who with? I told him. Never heard of him, he remarked decisively. This annoyed me. You will, I answered shortly. You will if you stay in the East. Oh, I'll stay in the East, don't you worry, he said, glancing at Daisy and then back at me as if he were alert for something more. I'd be a goddamn fool to live anywhere else. At this point, Miss Baker said, absolutely, with such suddenness that I started. It was the first word she had uttered since I came into the room. Evidently, it surprised her as much as it did me, for she yawned, and with a series of rapid, deft movements, stood up into the room. I'm stiff, she complained. I've been lying on that sofa for as long as I can remember. Don't look at me, Daisy retorted. I've been trying to get you to New York all afternoon. No thanks, said Miss Baker to the four cocktails just in from the pantry. I'm absolutely in training. Her host looked at her incredulously. You are... He took down his drink as if it were a drop in the bottom of a glass. How you ever get anything done is beyond me. So why is Jordan refusing an afternoon cocktail? It's pretty clear that she drinks on other afternoons. But Jordan has a plan. Daisy is trying to set Jordan up with her friend Nick. Jordan is in on this. Jordan is a professional athlete who is also a minor celebrity. Jordan believes that Nick will find her more desirable if, on his own, he figures out who she is. And so Jordan is trying to control the conversation here, to talk about her training, so that Nick will eventually realize that she is that Jordan Baker. I looked at Miss Baker, wondering what it was she got done. I enjoyed looking at her. She was a slender, small-breasted girl with an erect carriage, which she accentuated by throwing her body backward at the shoulders like a young cadet. Her gray, sun-strained eyes looked back at me with polite reciprocal curiosity out of a wan, charming, discontented face. It occurred to me now that I had seen her, or a picture of her, somewhere before. You live in West Egg, she remarked contemptuously. I know somebody there. I don't know a single. You must know Gatsby. Gatsby? demanded Daisy. What Gatsby? And here, Daisy gives away something important. She has not heard the name Gatsby for years. It is, after all, a made-up last name. It's an Americanized version of the Eastern European surname Gats. But in hearing this name again, Daisy responds, Gatsby? What Gatsby? In those three words, there is yearning and muted desperation. There is the longing for the past. Before I could reply that he was my neighbor, dinner was announced. Wedging his tense arm imperatively under mine, Tom Buchanan compelled me from the room as though he were moving a checker to another square. Slenderly, languidly, their hands set lightly on their hips, the two young women preceded us out onto a rosy-colored porch open toward the sunset, where four candles flickered on the table in the diminished wind. Why candles, objected Daisy, frowning. 
She snapped them out with her fingers. In two weeks, it'll be the longest day in the year. She looked at all of us radiantly. Do you always watch for the longest day of the year and then miss it? I always watch for the longest day in the year and then miss it. We ought to plan something, yawned Miss Baker, sitting down at the table as if she were getting into bed. All right, said Daisy. What'll we plan? She turned to me helplessly. What do people plan? And this simply is another example of the aimless glamour that surrounds Tom and Daisy. These are rich people without drive. Before I could answer, her eyes fastened with an odd expression on her little finger. Look, she complained, I heard it. We all looked. The knuckle was black and blue. You did it, Tom, she said accusingly. I know you didn't mean to, but you did do it. That's what I get for marrying a brute of a man. A great, big, hulking, physical specimen of a... I hate that word, hulking, objected Tom crossly. Even in kidding. Hulking, insisted Daisy. By pointing out this bruise, Daisy is communicating to Nick that she's in an abusive marriage. A marriage where Tom hits her. Why is she doing this? Does she want help? or sympathy? Does she want to shame her husband into being a better person? We don't yet know. But what we do know is this. Daisy is unhappy in her marriage. Sometimes she and Miss Baker talked at once, unobtrusively and with a bantering inconsequence that was never quite chatter, that was as cool as their white dresses and their impersonal eyes in the absence of all desire. They were here, and they accepted Tom and me, making only a polite, pleasant effort to entertain or to be entertained. They knew that presently dinner would be over, and a little later the evening, too, would be over, and casually put away. It was sharply different from the West, where an evening was hurried from phase to phase toward its close in a continually disappointed anticipation, or else in sheer nervous dread of the moment itself. "'You make me feel uncivilized, Daisy.' I confessed on my second glass of corky but rather impressive claret. Can't you talk about crops or something? I meant nothing in particular by this remark, but it was taken up in an unexpected way. Civilization's going to pieces, broke out Tom violently. I've gotten to be a terrible pessimist about things. Have you read The Rise of the Colored Empires by this man Goddard? Oh, I know, I answered, rather surprised by his tone. Well, it's a fine book, and everybody ought to read it. Here, Tom introduces these racist ideas into the conversation, ideas that everyone else at the dinner finds repulsive. So why is Tom drawn to these racist ideas? Well, Tom has never worked. He's never done anything to earn his tremendous wealth. But in these racist ideas, he finds a rationale that explains why he, Tom, a white person, is deserving of such riches. The idea is if we don't look out, the white race will be, will be utterly submerged. It's all scientific stuff that's been proved. Tom's getting very profound, said Daisy with an expression of unthoughtful sadness. He reads deep books with long words in them. What was that word we... Well, these books are all scientific, insisted Tom, glancing at her impatiently. This fella has worked out the whole thing. It's up to us, who are the dominant race, to watch out, or these other races will have control of things. And here, Daisy is making fun of her husband. Daisy isn't agreeing with Tom. She's mocking him. Tom may hit Daisy in private, but Daisy is smarter and more socially adept than her husband. She's able to make fun of him subtly and with humor in front of his friends. We've got to beat them down, whispered Daisy, winking ferociously toward the fervent sun. You ought to live in California, began Miss Baker, but Tom interrupted her by shifting heavily in his chair. The idea is that we're Nordics. I am, you are, you are, and... After an infinitesimal hesitation, he included Daisy with a slight nod, and she winked at me again. And we produced all the things that go to make civilization. Oh, uh, science, and art, and all that. You see? There was something pathetic in his concentration, as if his complacency, more acute than of old, was not enough to him any more. When almost immediately the telephone rang inside, and the butler left the porch, Daisy seized upon the momentary interruption and leaned toward me. I'll tell you a family secret, she whispered enthusiastically. It's about the butler's nose. You want to hear about the butler's nose?
Why is Daisy telling the story, the story about the butler's nose? It's clear that the story is one she's told many times before, a story that has no relation to the other topics in their conversation. She's doing it to distract Nick. So who is so rude to phone during the dinner hour? Why, Daisy has a pretty good idea. It's likely Tom's mistress, Myrtle. And Daisy doesn't want Nick to know that Tom, yet again, has a mistress. And so this story is an act of distraction. That's why I came over tonight. Well, he wasn't always a butler. He used to be the silver polisher for some people in New York and had a silver service for 200 people. He had to polish it from morning till night until finally it began to affect his nose. Things went from bad to worse, suggested Miss Baker. Yes, things went from bad to worse until finally he had to give up his position. For a moment, the last sunshine fell with romantic affection upon her glowing face. Her voice compelled me forward breathlessly as I listened. Then the glow faded, each light deserting her with lingering regret like children leaving a pleasant street at dusk. The butler came back and murmured something close to Tom's ear, whereupon... Tom frowned, pushed back his chair, and without a word went inside. As if his absence quickened something within her, Daisy leaned forward again, her voice glowing and singing. I love to see you at my table, Nick. You remind me of a, of a rose, an absolute rose, doesn't he? This is more of that same type of distracting conversation. Conversation that is designed to force Nick not to notice that Tom has gone in to take a phone call. She turned to Miss Baker for confirmation. An absolute rose. This was untrue. I am not even faintly like a rose. She was only extemporizing, but a stirring warmth flowed from her as if her heart was trying to come out to you concealed in one of those breathless, thrilling words. Then suddenly she threw her napkin on the table and excused herself and went into the house. Miss Baker and I exchanged a short glance consciously devoid of meaning. I was about to speak when she sat up alertly and said, Shh, in a warning voice. A subdued, impassioned murmur was audible in the room beyond, and Miss Baker leaned forward, unashamed, trying to hear. The murmur trembled on the verge of coherence, sank down, mounted excitedly, and then ceased altogether. This Mr. Gatsby you spoke of is my neighbor, I said. Don't talk. I want to hear what happens. Is something happening? I inquired innocently. You mean to say you don't know? Said Miss Baker, honestly surprised. I thought everybody knew. I don't. Why, she said hesitantly, Tom's got some woman in New York. Got some woman, I repeated blankly. Miss Baker nodded. She might have the decency not to telephone him at dinner time, don't you think? Almost before I had grasped her meaning, there was the flutter of a dress and the crunch of leather boots, and Tom and Daisy were back at the table. It couldn't be helped, cried Daisy with tense gaiety. She sat down, glanced searchingly at Miss Baker. And what is Daisy searching for? She wants to know if Jordan spilled the beans about Tom's affair while she was inside. And then at me, and continued... I looked outdoors for a minute, and it's very romantic outdoors. There's a bird on the lawn that I think must be a nightingale come over on the Cunard or White Star Line. He's singing away, her voice sang. It's romantic, isn't it, Tom? Very romantic, he said, and then miserably to me. If it's light enough after dinner, I want to take you down to the stables. The telephone rang inside, startlingly, and as Daisy shook her head decisively at Tom, the subject of the stables, in fact all subjects, vanished into air. Among the broken fragments of the last five minutes at table, I remember the candles being lit again, pointlessly, and I was conscious of wanting to look squarely at everyone and yet to avoid all eyes. I couldn't guess what Daisy and Tom were thinking, but I doubt if even Miss Baker, who seemed to have mastered a certain hardy skepticism, was able utterly to put this fifth guest's shrill metallic urgency out of mind. To a certain temperament, the situation might have seemed intriguing. My own instinct was to telephone immediately for the police. And here Nick understands that he's watching a marriage in which there are large forces at work, forces that he doesn't fully understand. The horses, needless to say, were not mentioned again. 
Tom and Miss Baker, with several feet of twilight between them, strolled back into the library, as if to a vigil beside a perfectly tangible body, while, trying to look pleasantly interested and a little deaf, I followed Daisy around a chain of connecting verandas to the porch in front. In its deep gloom, we sat down side by side on a wicker settee. Daisy took her face in her hands, as if feeling its lovely shape, and her eyes moved gradually out into the velvet dusk. I saw that turbulent emotions possessed her, so I asked what I thought would be some sedative questions about her little girl. We don't know each other very well, Nick, she said suddenly. Even if we were cousins, you didn't come to my wedding. I wasn't back from the war. That's true, she hesitated. Well, I've had a very bad time, Nick, and I'm... Pretty cynical about everything. Evidently, she had reason to be. I waited, but she didn't say any more, and after a moment, I returned rather feebly to the subject of her daughter. I suppose she talks and eats and everything. Oh, yes, she looked at me absently. Listen, Nick, let me tell you what I said when she was born. Would you like to hear? Very much. It'll show you how I've gotten to feel about... things... Well, she was less than an hour old, and Tom was God knows where. I woke up out of the ether with an utterly abandoned feeling, and asked the nurse right away if it was a boy or a girl. She told me it was a girl, and so I turned my head away and wept. All right, I said. I'm glad it's a girl. And I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl can be in this world. A beautiful little fool. You see, I think everything's terrible anyhow. She went on in a convinced way. Everybody thinks so. The most advanced people. And I know. In this section of conversation, Daisy is doing something both mean and charming. She tells Nick that things are terrible, especially for women. But then, realizing how much she sounds like her husband, she again picks up Tom's voice and repeats things that he has said. Everyone thinks so, the most advanced people. In doing this, she adds a sense of comic irony to her own observations. I've been everywhere and seen everything and done everything. Her eyes flashed around her in a defiant way, rather like Tom's, and she laughed with thrilling scorn. Sophisticated. God, I am sophisticated. The instant her voice broke off, ceasing to compel my attention, my belief, I felt the basic insincerity of what she had said. It made me uneasy, as though the whole evening had been a trick of some sort to exact a contributory emotion from me. I waited, and sure enough, in a moment she looked at me with an absolute smirk on her lovely face, as if she had asserted her membership in a rather distinguished secret society to which she and Tom belonged. Inside, the crimson room bloomed with light. Tom and Miss Baker sat at either end of the long couch, and she read aloud to him from the Saturday Evening Post, the words, murmurous and uninflected, running together in a soothing tune. The lamplight, bright on his boots and dull on the autumn leaf yellow of her hair, glinted along the paper as she turned a page with a flutter of slender muscles in her arms. When we came in, she held us silent for a moment with a lifted hand. To be continued, she said, tossing the magazine on the table, in our very next issue. Her body asserted itself with a restless movement of her knee, and she stood up. Ten o'clock, she remarked, apparently finding the time on the ceiling. Time for this good girl to go to bed. Jordan's going to play in the tournament tomorrow, explained Daisy, over at Westchester. Oh, you're Jordan Baker. I knew now why her face was familiar. Its pleasing, contemptuous expression had looked out at me from many rotogravure pictures of the sporting life at Asheville and Hot Springs and Palm Beach. I had heard some story of her, too, a critical, unpleasant story, but what it was I had forgotten long ago. Good night, she said softly. Wake me at eight, won't you? If you'll get up. I will. So this act that Jordan's put on tonight, calling attention subtly to her celebrity as an athlete, has worked. It's encouraged Nick's interest in her. Good night, Mr. Carraway. See you anon. Of course you will, confirmed Daisy. In fact, I think I'll arrange a marriage. Come over often, Nick, and I'll sort of, oh, fling you together. 
you know, lock you up accidentally in linen closets and push you out to sea in a boat and all that sort of thing. Good night, called Miss Baker from the stairs. I haven't heard a word. She's a nice girl, said Tom after a moment. They oughtn't to let her run around the country this way. Who oughtn't to? inquired Daisy coldly. Her family. Her family is one aunt about a thousand years old. Besides, Nick's going to look after her, aren't you, Nick? She's going to spend lots of weekends out here this summer. I think the home influence will be very good for her. Daisy and Tom looked at each other for a moment in silence. Is she from New York, I asked quickly. From Louisville. Our white girlhood was passed together there. Our beautiful white... This, of course, is another moment in which Daisy pokes fun at her husband's absurd racist beliefs. Did you give Nick a little hot-to-hot -hot talk on the veranda? demanded Tom suddenly. Did I? She looked at me. I can't seem to remember. But I think we talked about the Nordic race. Yes, I'm sure we did. It sort of crept up on us, and first thing you know... Don't believe everything you hear, Nick, he advised me. A couple of pages later, after leaving the dinner party, Nick sees Gatsby for the first time. Nick is at home. He refers to it formally as an estate, but really it's a small cottage. He walks out back by the water to find Gatsby staring off at the city. Nick believes that Gatsby is wondering how much of this great city might someday be his. But that's not at all what Gatsby is thinking about. And when I reached my estate at West Egg, I ran the car under its shed and sat for a while on an abandoned grass roller in the yard. The wind had blown off, leaving a loud, bright night with wings beating in the trees and a persistent organ sound as the full bellows of the earth blew the frogs full of life. The silhouette of a moving cat wavered across the moonlight, and turning my head to watch it, I saw that I was not alone. Fifty feet away, a figure had emerged from the shadow of my neighbor's mansion and was standing with his hands in his pockets, regarding the silver pepper of the stars. Something in his leisurely movements and the secure position of his feet upon the lawn suggested that it was Mr. Gatsby himself come out to determine what share was his of our local heavens. I decided to call to him. Miss Baker had mentioned him at dinner, and that would do for an introduction. But I didn't call to him, for he gave a sudden intimation that he was content to be alone. He stretched out his arms toward the dark water in a curious way, and far as I was from him, I could have sworn he was trembling. Involuntarily I glanced seaward and distinguished nothing except a single green light, minute and far away, that might have been the end of a dock. When I looked once more for Gatsby, he had vanished, and I was alone again in the unquiet darkness. Though Nick doesn't know this yet, and neither do we as readers, Gadsby is not looking off with predatory financial ambitions towards the city of New York. He's looking at Daisy's house, at the green light fixed to the end of her dock. Five years ago, Gadsby was a soldier without a dollar to his name. He was also in love with Daisy. He has spent the last five years single-mindedly remaking himself so that he might be a suitable partner for her. That is, he wants to win back her hand. He has purposely picked this house because it is right across the water from Daisy's house. Early in this chapter, Jordan Baker believed that if Nick recognized her celebrity on his own, it would have a larger impact on him than if someone explained it. Gatsby has a similar plan. Gatsby wants Daisy to realize for herself that here now is Gadsby, the man she once loved. Here he is, wealthy, successful, able to take care of her in a manner to which she has become accustomed. Each weekend, Gadsby holds fabulous parties for one reason and one reason only. They are not because Gadsby enjoys a good time, nor are they because Gadsby has many close friends he likes to entertain. They are designed to bring 
Daisy over to his house so that she might see his mansion, his cars, and finally, so she might see Gatsby himself, the man who has believed that by remaking himself, through hard work and determination, he can win the hand of his boyhood love. Before sending you off to read the second half of this novel, I believe that there are four more things I should point out. One, this novel is described as a novel of modernism. But where is the modernism? Well, we've already talked a little about the acknowledged subjectivity of the narrator, but the modernism can also be seen in the writing style as well. Fitzgerald employs lush descriptions to build his scenes. These descriptions often transform the reality of New York in the 1920s to an artistic vision of that city. For example, the stretch of Long Island where new immigrants live, the area where the Wilsons have their filling station, is renamed the Valley of Ashes. In this, Fitzgerald transforms a real location by renaming it in such a way as to attach personal meaning to it. By this, the vision of New York becomes uniquely Nick's vision of New York. 2. This is a novel about many people trying to rise in terms of class and wealth. In the second chapter, we meet Myrtle Wilson. Myrtle believes that she can rise in terms of class and wealth, not through hard work, rather through romantic attachments. Her affair with Tom is not only about love and romance, it's also a way for her to rise up the social ladder. At the end of this chapter, we also see the great physical violence of which Tom is capable. Unable to persuade people through argumentation, Tom often resorts to cruelty. I'm reading now from chapter 2. Sometime toward midnight, Tom Buchanan and Miss Wilson stood face to face, discussing in impassioned voices whether Mrs. Wilson had any right to mention Daisy's name. Daisy, 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 shouted Mrs. Wilson. I'll say it whenever I want to. Daisy, da... Making a short, deft movement, Tom Buchanan broke her nose with his open hand. Then there were bloody towels upon the bathroom floor and women's voices scolding and high over the confusion, a long, broken wail of pain. As you continue through the novel, keep this image in mind and remember that this type of hostility resides in Tom. 3. The version of the American dream that Fitzgerald wanted to interrogate is one popularized by the author Horatio Alger. Horatio Alger wrote novels for young adults. His books were extremely popular, far more so than the Harry Potter books today. Most every young American boy would have read at least one of the Alger books, most of which had very similar plots. To explain how the Horatio Alger novels worked, I'm going to read a little about one of the more popular novels, one called Ragged Dick. Out of a resolve to expose the harsh life of poor, urban children, Horatio Alger wrote Ragged Dick in 1866. He would pack an emotional punch in this book, graphically displaying the horror of juvenile life on the street. The idea that there were parents who could abandon or abuse children was new to many Americans. Alger would disabuse them by going face to face with the problems of the age, introducing two youths whose lives were modeled on real people he had met in his travels. The main character, named Ragged Dick, is a striver, anxious to work his way up from boot blacking to something better. Barely literate at first, Dick Hunter finds a counselor his own age, although far better educated. Henry Fosdick is the son of a printer and familiar with the dictionary. Dick tells him, I don't want to grow up ignorant. I want to grow up respectable. Thus motivated, the ignorant youth 
learns the value of honesty, integrity, education, and hard work, including work on himself. He picks up rudimentary arithmetic skills. He improves his vocabulary and discovers the value of books. He comes to bathe more frequently, to dress better, and to save money. Dick needs only one break. It comes when he chances to be at the South Ferry Slip when a little boy falls in the water. Without hesitation, Dick plunges in and saves the child from drowning. An instant demonstration of resourcefulness, courage, self-risk. In short, a demonstration of character. The grateful father, a prosperous businessman, interviews the rescuer. Satisfied that the well-mannered Dick has the right stuff, he inquires, How would you like to enter my counting room as a clerk, Richard? The next week, en route to a new life, our hero is cheerfully reminded that he can no longer go by his nickname. Says his friend, You must drop that name and think of yourself now as Richard Hunter Esquire, a young gentleman on the way to fame and fortune. As you continue through The Great Gadsby, notice how F. Scott Fitzgerald reuses many of these same plot elements in his own story. The Horatio Alger plot often includes a main character born into poverty, who then tries to improve himself through education, saving, and hard work, who also is able to endear himself to a successful businessman who then serves as the boy's mentor, and lastly, who then changes his name and style of dress so as to radiate his new success. The question that Fitzgerald is asking then is this, is this version of the American dream actually possible in America? 4. Initially, the parties at Gadsby's house appear fabulous. I'm reading now from chapter 3. There was music from my neighbor's house through the summer nights. In his blue gardens, men and girls came and went like moths among the whisperings and the champagne and the stars. At high tide in the afternoon, I watched his guests diving from the tower of his raft or taking the sun on the hot sand of his beach while his two motorboats slit the water of the sound drawing aquaplanes over cataracts of foam. On weekends, his Rolls Royce became an omnibus, bearing parties to and from the city between nine in the morning and long past midnight, while his station wagon scampered like a brisk yellow bug to meet all the trains. And on Mondays, eight servants, including an extra gardener, toiled all day with mops and scrubbing brushes and hammers and gardening shears, repairing the ravages of the night before. But by chapter four, Gadsby knows the parties are failing. They are not bringing Daisy to his house. He doesn't understand exactly where he went wrong, at least not yet. He has made a miscalculation as to how the truly wealthy live. They don't hold wild parties to celebrate their wealth. That's something done by the nouveau riche. Rather, in terms of public appearance, people with old money tend toward quiet, respectable lives. So Gadsby needs a new plan to bring Daisy to his house. This is where Nick comes in, the neighbor who miraculously is related to the girl he loves. I will leave you there. You are now set up for the second half of The Great Gadsby one of the cornerstones of American literature. I'll see you in class next time.